There's a song that they sing in the marshland I heard it first as a boy And the song that they sang in the marshland Filled my childhood with peace and with joy And it calls me still And it calls me still Come back, come back to the marshland Cause we're fading fast away As I wandered alone in the marshland Through the tall grass silent and still Saw the muskrat at work while a blackbird shirt The coyote lurking round for the kill have you ever been out in the marshland At the eerie breaking of dawn Heard the lone pipe bill cry Seen the marsh hawk fly As the wind in the grass joins the song And it calls me still It calls me still Come back, come back to the marshland Cause we're fading fast About 1850, Henry David Thoreau wrote, A flock of geese has just got in late. Who knows, but they had expected to find the ponds open. How indispensable are one or two flocks of geese in the spring and autumn. Moving northward to their ancestral breeding grounds each year, they arrive early like spirited homesteaders as spring lengthens the period of daylight. This is a story of life, retold year after year by thousands of whistling wings. A story immortalized by balladeers, writers, artists, and photographers. By men who have devoted their lives to portraying for others the natural scene about them. Such a man is wildlife photographer and conservationist Dick Borden. He has brought to millions both understanding and concern for wild things for he has shared with them his deep reverence and appreciation for the rhythm of the marsh. Roseate Turn in Manitoba scans the shallows below for minnows. To capture the scene, the wildlife photographer must know the subject, and he must be patient. Of course, like a cameraman, the turn is not always successful. Noted outdoorsman and sports announcer Kurt Gowdy recently visited his old friend Dick Borden. 
and with him we may learn some of the secrets of the wildlife photographer. Uh, I was always fascinated by wildlife and then after I got out of college and color film came in, I bought a used camera and a telephoto lens and started to get out in the marsh and photograph wildlife. Well, I've done enough hunting and fishing, for instance, in a marsh like this to know that the most important thing is getting close to the wildlife. How do you do this? Well, we have several devices. One thing we have is this electrically driven sneak boat. Yeah. And this is a, a, another means of taking a camera out into the marsh without disturbing it. Now, did you buy this? Did you build it yourself? I had to build it, Kurt. As you can see, it's narrow and, and the low profile. What uh, steers the boat? What kind of a power? I have a power plant here with this electric outboard. And then in order to leave both my hands free, I steer the motor with one foot. And I can regulate speeds with the other foot. You mean you lie down in there? Yeah, I lie down, <laughs> rest my head on that. And uh, in that way, I have both uh, my hands free to go. Isn't that uncomfortable? Well, I had a long time out in, it, yeah. in the sun. It is a little, I can tell you. Looks like you're going to the moon, like one of the astronauts <laughs> huh, in the shell. Well, another thing, we have about 150 pounds of lead in it to get it low. Oh, yeah, you want a low profile. Yeah, and she's a little cranky. How long can you keep this rig running, Dick? I can keep it going for about 10 hours out in the marsh and go roughly 10 miles before the batteries are pretty well down. Mm -hmm. Then you have to come in. You know, you and I have bummed around quite a bit yeah. together, and I've heard you talk about some of these Hollywood uh, features you worked on, outdoor features. Have you used this boat on those? Yes, I have, Kurt, as a matter of fact, and I've worked fairly extensively on uh, Walt Disney's True Life Adventure series that have been well received. Have you ever had any odd experiences in this? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I did, Kurt. I, I was down in the Everglades and out in this big marsh, and an otter saw it and thought it was a floating log. I was just drifting along slowly. He climbed out on the bow and four or five feet from my face. You get the close-up? I blew it. it. You blew the close-up. I blew it. I had a lens on that was too long and I couldn't focus that close. And I'll tell you one thing, you'd better have an otter in there and an alligator, wouldn't you? You can say that twice, because when she goes down, she'll go down fast with that weight. And I never have tipped it over to sunk it so far. Come on, get, let me take a look at this one, Captain, and see how it works. <laughs> it's like quite a involvement even getting into it. Yeah. And this really can you just glide very, very slowly, and this doesn't scare the birds, huh? No, that's right. to intrude into an undisturbed marsh. No noise, camera mounted on my chest. Nice and slow. These muskrats hardly know I'm there. I'm having a little fun with this young fella by speeding up. Down in Texas, I was working on white pelicans that are wintering there. Again, a slow, easy approach. Then you have to get with it in a hurry when the old boy takes off. In the Manitoba prairies, we try a sneak on the lordly canvas back. Here too, easy does it. A little bit nervous, and then he lets me get really pretty close. Oh, 
still in the prairies, a lone Canada goose is always welcome. I like this better than a large flock. There are too many eyes watching you when you got a big bunch of birds. Again, nice and slow. This is the critical time right now. The rhythm of the marsh picks up dramatically as spring returns to the prairies each year. Arriving migrant waterfowl stake out and announce their breeding territories. A bittern and pied-billed grebe call. While appearing to preen the feathers of their backs, western grebes are in fact beginning their courtship ceremony. As nearby pelicans begin feeding, the grebes display with nesting material. Until pairing is finalized, it sometimes takes three to tango. Small fish are readily caught and shared. Sometimes the generosity of the donor overwhelms the recipient. Many behavior patterns may have no significance to the casual observer, but in the world of the marsh, they may mean the difference between life and death. Pelicans dip their heads in unison while feeding. A fish alarmed by one down thrust bill may end up in an adjacent pouch. The competition for space and food has been continued and refined for eons of time with little help from man. All birds and animals must share a fragile environment. Although western grebes are colonial nesters, they maintain quite strict territorial boundaries, and an intruder is chased out in a hurry. Thank <laughs> you. 
we go get this. You know, in sports, we say you got to keep on the ball. Keep your eyes on the ball. I don't know how you stay with that action uh, on those birds the way they move. Well, is that requires specialized gear again, Kurt. And this Borden camera gun is one way to help beat that problem. What is this, your own invention? Yeah, I had to work this out to get these flight shots that you were asking about. You swing it just like shooting skeet, huh? Yeah, just exactly. You see, I can swing right around like that. And swinging a camera as fast as that, it's important that it's running slow or slow motion. Well, oh, this is all in slow motion. Yes, this, this camera will run up to 500 frames a second, which is 12 feet of film a second. And then we project it at regular speed, and that's what slows it down. Just pull the trigger here. And here, Kurt, is an external sight that gives me a point of aim. Let me see, is that heavy? Yeah, it's quite heavy. Oh, you, it is. You're handy with a gun there. You should do well with that, Kurt. Oh, now, you got some crosshairs in here. Yeah, you see, that gives you your point of aim for the telephoto lens. Right on it, I see, right. Small bodies of water known as potholes in the Canadian prairies are favored breeding grounds for a wide variety of ducks, like the ruddy duck and the handsome shoveler drake. A pair of pintails preen quietly. Nearby, a lesser scaw paddles serenely in calm water, while a pair of close relatives, the ringnecks, glide past. Green-winged teal and the more western cinnamon teal are also on territory. Canvasbacks have recently declined in number and are a cause of concern. Perhaps our most strikingly marked duck is the immaculate drake wood duck. The white scimitar at the base of his bill easily identifies the blue-winged teal as a pintail feeds nearby. A redhead shows his finery, and a pair of blue-winged teal tip up in shallow water. Not only ducks inhabit the marshland, the morning may also bring a hungry coyote to the water's edge. The jackrabbit must remain alert. So too, the western meadowlark feeding in the grass. Early morning finds male prairie chickens on their booming or dancing grounds, inflating their yellow neck sacks and strutting for their hens. Another unusual courtship display. the least interested observer of his dance is the finely barred hen as she wanders by. Prairie dog doesn't miss a trick. There's a lot of sparring and jumping between competing cocks, but there is little serious fighting. After all, this is a time for making love, not real conflict. The warning cry of a ground squirrel announces the slanting approach of a peregrine falcon. All prairie residents respect his hunting prowess.
At moments like these, the badger's deep hole is pretty inviting. Even the prairie chickens abandon their morning ritual. Deep in the Florida Everglades, dawn finds many birds arriving at their feeding grounds. with a moss-hung southern swamp. Along with the Florida gallinule. Once the object of the devastating plume trade, the snowy egret is adept at surface feeding as well as wading. In these southern swamps, the rhythm of life closely parallels that in northern marshes. For all birds and animals share the same needs for freedom, food, and a healthy environment. Roseate spoonbills and black skimmers are highly specialized feeders. Lateral sweeps of the spoonbill's broadened outer bill sift small animal life from the ooze. The black skimmer's lower mandible is longer than the upper one. He can scoop small organisms from the surface while in flight. In the Everglades, you often find yourself in a waiting situation. Believe me, I'm more concerned about a deep hole than an alligator. I've always been lured by immaculate white birds against a clear blue sky. Most marsh animals could care less about my intrusion into their water world. into wild country, I'm often aware that many things are not just as they should be. For instance, the stately bald eagle is our national emblem and he's in trouble. Hard pesticides like DDT in the food chain have adversely affected the female's ability to assimilate calcium. She lays thin-walled eggs that are crushed by her body weight during incubation. Without replacement young, a species doesn't last very long. This active nest has produced no young in four years. They roam through the marsh as a boy, and it calls me still. It calls me still. Come back, come 
back to the marshland Cause we're fading fast away Dick Borden discovered long ago that to photograph wild birds and animals, he had to be where they are. Yeah, this is a portable blind made of fiberglass. Where do you get it? Did you buy this? No, I had to make this again, Kurt, and I actually sewed the cover that goes on it. Well, you put this cover yes. on it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Doesn't weigh much, very light, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, about three pounds, and I can set it up in about two minutes. And easy to take any place. I need the blind well out in the marsh on a firm base. I assemble the base ring. and the side rods all come together at the top. There are generally plenty of interested eyes watching my disappearing act. When everything calms down, the tranquil marsh is a great place to be. A pied bill grebe returns to her floating nest. In early spring, I sometimes find myself in a blind at the edge of a New England woodlot. As the moon sets early in the morning, the wily rough grouse begins his courtship display. Ken takes in his muffled drumming and his ruffled pose. to an eastern marsh, one of the earliest nesters are mated pairs of Canada geese. These birds mate for life, and both birds defend the brood. As a result, Canada geese generally raise the majority of young that are hatched. With goslings in the nest, their alertness to danger increases considerably. The arrival of a marauding raccoon becomes their first family crisis.
peace and quiet return to the marsh, and the youngsters are closely escorted away from the nesting island to the shallow end of the pond. However, friendly people and their pets often create additional problems for the young family. charges are permitted the luxury of feeding on new green shoots that have just appeared in a nearby cove. Other broods soon appear, and Mother Coot solicitously feeds her little chicks. Like humans, she seems to reprimand him for his table manners. The marsh is now alive with new residents. The canvasback duck has her nest on a muskrat house. While a green-winged teal passes by with eight downy ducklings. In the bushy marsh edge, a brown thrasher feeds her fledglings. While a goldfinch feeds on thistles, the grouse family calmly searches the grass for insect life. A cedar waxwing coughs up succulent berries for her hungry youngsters as a hummingbird probes for sweet nectar. The scarlet tanager suns in a nearby tree, while mother red-winged blackbird arrives to feed her young in an old coil of barbed wire. The thing of, you ever use anything high? Yeah, now for instance, you take an osprey's nest that could be 40 feet in the air. I can move this vertically 35 feet up into the air on a monopod that's guyed with six wires. Many people have often thought me a little foolish to rig a contraption like this. But for photographing many birds, there's no other way. Ascending a 30-foot pole with a blind and equipment is often a little hairy, believe me. But the rewards at the top are real. A great horned owl's nest can be quite a challenge also, Kurt. Even a blind can't hide me completely, though, and they generally know I'm there. High over a New England pond, Dick Borden trains his camera on the beautiful and graceful osprey, or fish hawk. This bird eats fish exclusively and is found near coastal marshes and swamps, as well as near inland wetlands. The osprey exists on top of the natural food chain, in the same way that the bald eagle does. And in a similar way, this great bird is threatened. Again, hard pesticides sprayed on the watershed are concentrated in the fatty tissues of many animals which are links in the food chain. Finally, the osprey catches fish with significant amounts of these chemicals stored in their bodies. This female is tending but a single chick. 
while an unhatched egg lies in the nest. Cracked eggs and low hatchability have been clearly linked to pesticides in the environment. Several years ago, Rachel Carson sounded the alarm, and the cries of conservationists continue. But agricultural interests find it difficult to read the handwriting on the wall. Progress has been made in banning the use of hard pesticides, it is true. But these are persistent poisons, and they can be around for a long time. Man is very much involved in this ecological malaise and vigorous abatement to environmental contamination is in order. We learn when we sit in the marsh that the rhythm here is one of life and of death. And we learn the ultimate lesson of the marsh, that all things great and small live off things that are smaller still. An eared grebe tries to divert the coot then hurries back to her nest. Too late, perhaps, and she must nest again or fail to produce young this season. This doesn't necessarily mean fewer greaves next year nor more coot. Through natural predation, a fluctuating balance of population results that the environment can support. Young birds, as well as eggs, are part of the natural food chain. And a red-winged blackbird attacks a passing crow. Prowling skunks are well-recognized nest predators. A marsh hawk poses no real threat to a canvasback brood. But all hawks are viewed with concern by the cautious duck. When a red squirrel scolds at the marsh edge, there is generally good reason. The shoe button eyes of a white-footed mouse read the squirrel's warning, but only time will tell what his fate will be. Man should be wise enough to know that trying to eliminate predators is in most instances a misguided effort. Man, the ultimate predator, holds the power to destroy. When living conditions deteriorate in the natural world, man himself will succumb with his wild neighbors. Photography does take a lot of time, Kurt, but it's a real challenge. It's taken to me a lot to a lot of beautiful places. You've been all over the world, haven't you? All over the world, working on it. What's your family think about this? They seem to eat it up. They like the work I'm doing. In the course of my work, of course, I've also brought in pets into the family. What kind? Wild pets. What kind? 
Well, we brought in otter, a couple of little otters. Otters make pets? Oh, tremendous. When they're not playing and romping and having a good time, they're sleeping. That's the next step. Are they smart? Yeah, they're smart, and we were very lucky because we had a young pup that was brought into the family at the same time as the otter kid, and they became bosom pals. <laughs> goslings that I took as two or three days old, brought them into the family, and this is called imprinting, where they attach themselves to their parents, and then when you become their parents, they think they're people rather than geese. Interesting pet? Fabulous, fabulous pet. I came back from Canada the one time with a three-week-old coyote pup, a little bitch, and she melted right into the family the way the artists did, and the kids loved them. Did you train the dog? I mean, just like a domesticated uh, dog? Yeah, we, I only had to shut her up at night so she wouldn't wander, but the rest of the time, she ran free around the place, and really an astounding pet. together, learn one another's idiosyncrasies, and be part of the family. I don't really recommend, on the whole, bringing wild pets into the family. It's a real responsibility. It's of long duration. We were just lucky, Kurt, because we had a place where there was room for them to roam. We fed them carefully, and they became part of us. Again, we didn't keep him penned up. I think an animal or a bird penned up is like a man in jail a little bit. You don't see his real character. Uh -huh. You turn him loose, let him do his thing, then you really get to know what they're like, and they're great. You know, I never realized you had such a family. That's a real family. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you one thing. They're patient as well as loving. I can tell you that. That's beautiful. Many ponds and marshes in western mountains which attract native wildlife, such as Barrow's golden eye, are created by the beaver.
With strong necks and backs and chisel-like teeth, these instinctive water-level engineers create dams and channels to trap and direct mountain streams. The high summer sun warms the world of the marsh. White-tailed deer are drawn to succulent lily pads in the clear, dark water of the beaver impoundment. Mountain marshes, such as in Wyoming, are home to a wide variety of wildlife. Rough-legged hawks play in flight as they ride the updrafts of mountain breezes as a brood of trumpeter swans swims in the shallows below. A relaxed old bobcat takes in their flight maneuvers until his attention is drawn elsewhere. A mother cinnamon bear appears to be a bit uncertain on how to get her playful cubs back to dry land. Further out in the marsh, a bull moose is thoroughly accustomed to deeper water. Not many years ago, trumpeter swans were considered an endangered species. They have responded encouragingly to protection and management. From New England's wetlands and Florida's swamps to the Canadian prairies and these high beaver ponds, the rhythm of life goes on. The young of early spring become the adults of approaching autumn. In New England, swamp maples are the first to turn as leaf maturity brings forth a diversity of reds, oranges, yellows, and golds. Something in the autumn air brings changes to the daily rhythm. Shorter days and frosty nights mean the time of migration is at hand. On their way from subarctic breeding grounds, Canada geese stop to rest and feed in shallow water. expectant, they come on in loosely knit formation, knowing that in this national wildlife refuge, they will have sanctuary until they push on to wintering grounds further south. The quiet whir of the camera gun is no deterrent to them as they bank against russet foliage on set wings for the final approach. You know, Dick, we hear a lot about the loss of our wetlands through filling and draining, and if so, what'll happen to our marshlands and the wildlife in them? I don't know, Kurt. Uh, we're losing much too much of our wetlands. On the federal level, the Department of Agriculture is encouraging drainage, and the Department of Interior is struggling to keep them wet and undisturbed. Sort of like the right hand working against the left hand. Yes, it is. And, of course, when the habitat's gone, the wildlife's gone. Of course, you've shot wildlife all over the world with your camera. What about wildlife? 
Well, I think we just have got to make up our mind that if we aren't concerned about it, we're going to lose a lot of it. I know one thing, it's, it's going to be a tragedy if our children will not be able to see the rhythm of the marshes taking place in the future. It sure will. You hear that clamor of wildfowl? Boy, when that's gone, we've lost something. You know, we've been lucky. We've been around and uh, we've had good fishing. We've seen a lot of things, a lot of good wildlife. These children are very concerned about it now. And they should be. And it would be a real loss if in their lifetime they couldn't have had some of these experiences that you and I had. Right. It's their heritage, and they have a right to it. When the birds leave their home in the marshland For the place where warm waters lie Will they come back again to the marshland for them? Will the spring bear a cold, silent sky? And it calls me still. It calls me still. Come back, come back to the marshland. Cause we're fading fast away.